Good morning. First of all, shout out to the tech crew. <laughs> you guys are doing an amazing job. That is not an easy, <laughs> an easy job. Um, when I told my best friend that I was preaching the Sunday after going to camp, she said, who makes your church calendar? <laughs> and I said, I did it to myself <laughs> because I wanted this passage so much. I ran to Peter's office and I said, I know I'm going to regret this, but this is the passage I want. <laughs> and so, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to shout out the Inses, Mark and Deanne, and the Brennans, Jim and Karen, for lending us their cars for the youth trip. Thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> um, and Caleb Ince, he very literally pulled me through a canyon. So, um, but here I am, bruised, bug bit, scraped. I won't show you my legs. <laughs> And if I'm honest, I'm so tired. <laughs> but I have a confession to make. <laughs> I have a confession. I really struggle with David. In fact, most days, I don't know if I even like him. <laughs> and I know I'm in the minority here because people love David. They lo You're named after David. People love David. They're like, he's my favorite Bible character. People who have never read the Bible know about David. And I'm just not one of them. <laughs> and I hope you stick with me in the wrestling. <laughs> because I'll give him this. He certainly is an interesting character. <laughs> he's got a lot of screen time, and he's a mixed bag. He's got his good parts. He's got his bad parts. In many of the stories, he is the hero, and he is a Christ figure. We collectively remember David as a powerless, vulnerable teenager that God plucked out of the wilderness and set on a throne. Yet, the whole story of Samuel is introduced by the song of Hannah, which lets us know that the whole scroll including 1st and 2nd Samuel, is going to be about the great reversal, where the Lord brings low the mighty and uplifts the poor and needy. And in today's story, we see the tragic reverse in the story arc of David's life, where he's no longer an example of the lowly brought up to exaltation by God, but of the one who God will bring low on behalf of the vulnerable. And I think by honoring David's whole story, remembering the part of who David is, holding all the pieces, the good, the bad, the victories, as well as the losses, we'll come to a deeper understanding of what it truly means to be the beloved of God, to know God's covenant faithfulness, to us and to hopefully give all of us, myself included, the courage to let God's grace work in all the pieces of our lives. So our first passage today comes from 2 Samuel chapter 12. And you can turn there, but we're not going to get into it just yet. Um, we have to get a little bit of context before we dive in. I'll be taking a little bit more of a broad stroke approach <laughs> to this, so we won't get into the weeds. I just don't have time. It's so good, but I don't have time. And I'm going to put my teacher hat on for a moment. We're all going to do our scholarly Bible work today. So the entire scroll of Samuel is the response to the call that is Judges, the scroll that came before. And Judges ask the question, how is Israel going to get out of the downward spiral that it's in? They just keep going around and down and down and down. And the story is marked very pointedly and strategically by stories of women to show just how far the society has degraded because women and specifically daughters in this time were the most vulnerable in society. And as society spirals down, 
those who are most vulnerable become victims. It was true then, and it's true today. Judges tragically ends with a civil war breaking out in response to the horrific violence done against one woman. That woman shows not only the state that the people of Israel are in, but also how greatly one unnamed, seemingly unimportant person's wounds can affect us all. As the reader is still left with the lingering question, what can be done to get Israel out of the spiral it's in? Have you ever asked yourself that? How can I get out of this spiral? It seems like no matter how hard I try, I end up right back into this pattern, into this rotation. Maybe it's a personal struggle. When I feel anxious, this is what I turn to to try to make me feel better. Maybe it's a relational struggle. Every time I think my relationship with fill in the blank is getting better, we fall back into the same pattern. Maybe it was handed down to you from past generations. Whatever it is, when it gets painful and costly, we try to find solutions. Maybe if I try this, maybe if I try that. For the Israelites, who were going in through a lot of pain, <laughs> what they decided on to try to fix the spiral was to have a king, which, of course, brings us to David, the second king of Israel. And the chapter we're looking at today placed strategically in between two parallel passages about women who are assaulted. It turns out that the solution didn't work. And once again, the vulnerable have become victims. And we see just how far down in the spiral David's kingship has gone, with the chapters that follow describing the civil war that flows from the act of violence done against one woman. Do we see the parallels? These are two of the most tragic chapters in the Bible, but I think there's beauty waiting for us when we don't skip over the hard parts. So if you're there already, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Oh, chapter 12. But before that, the context is chapter 11, where we get the story of David and Uriah and Bathsheba. Now, if you've been around in church, you know this story. <laughs> but if you haven't, let me just recap for a second. So King David takes Bathsheba, who was Uriah's wife, while he was away fighting in the war that David should have been in. And when she told him she was pregnant, he hatched a scheme for Uriah to think it was his baby by bringing him back. And when that didn't work, because Uriah was a righteous man, he sent Uriah back to the front lines, carrying in his own hands the order for him to be killed, which resulted in his death and the death of many other soldiers. At which point, David brought Bathsheba into his household to be one of his many wives. In chapter 13, the one that follows, we get the story of how just as Bathsheba was assaulted by David, David's daughter is assaulted by her half-brother Amnon, and David does not give her justice. Although he was the judge of the land, he didn't say a word. If you read the passage, you'll notice that the author doesn't even introduce Tamar as David's daughter. They say she's Absalom's sister. It's almost as if David didn't step into his role as her father enough to be her association. Once again, the vulnerable have become the victims, and the powerless pay the price the powerful laid on them. Now, it's easy to think, God, if you cared, you wouldn't have let this happen. How many of us, at one time or another, have cried out to God, why didn't you stop that from happening? Or why didn't you stop me from doing that when you knew what the cost would be? But as we're about to read, God does care. God gives us his wisdom to follow and his spirit to follow, and he doesn't limit our ability to choose his way 
by making the choice for us. So let's read about the chapter in between Bathsheba and Tamar, how God decides to respond to David's evil. Let's start in 2 Samuel 12, 12, 1 through 13. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for, what, for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight in front of all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. The word of the Lord. Heavy, right? There's so much we can dive into too, with this passage, but there are two things I'm going to focus on. The first First is verse 1. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. Let's pause there. The chapter before, we are told that Bathsheba hears that her husband is dead, and she laments. Her tears did nothing to convince David that he had sinned. He had no pity, no remorse. He thought he had gotten away with it. God had to send someone who David would actually listen to to hear his message. This particular lesson is one that comes up a little early in life. I see it all the time working with youth. <laughs> that if something is wrong, to be silent is to be complicit. The problem is, it's so hard to speak up. It's so much easier to distance ourselves from the pain than to step into it. But that's exactly what God does for us and exactly how we show who God is to the world when we enter in. As Christ followers, we should be the number one advocates for the vulnerable 
because Jesus right now sits at the right hand of God the Father and advocates for us. Right now, the Spirit is advocating for us. So we need to ask ourselves, who should I be using my voice to advocate for? If no one comes to mind, we've probably distanced ourselves a little too much from the cries of the vulnerable. For Nathan, the cost of speaking up was most likely death. There are a lot of prophets in the Bible who confront kings, and the response of the king is usually to try and kill them. But here, Nathan is risking his life to deliver a message, to speak for the one who was silenced and ignored. And so he hides the message in a story, a story that David doesn't realize he's already lived. And when David pronounces a judgment, he does not realize that he has told Nathan that the justice for his actions would be for him to die and pay back four times what he stole for his lack of pity. There's so much here that we can get, it, get into, but for today, I want us to see that in verse 13, David confesses to Nathan that he has sinned against God. And you might be thinking, yeah, but he also sinned against a whole bunch of other people too. Well, the Bible over and over again shows that God so aligns God's self with humanity that to wrong a fellow human being is to wrong God. And to treat people rightly is to be in right relationship with God. Which is a pretty sobering thought when I look at all my relationships with the people around me. How casually I take treating my neighbor when to God it's how I show my affection or contempt towards him. But notice that as soon as David confesses his sin, Nathan, Nathan says that God has taken his sin away and pronounces that David will not die. How quick is the grace of God to respond to our repentance? As Christians, we know that David's sin was laid upon Jesus at the cross, and the death that rightly belonged to David was taken by Jesus too so that David did not have to be separated by God from God. Years and years before Jesus was born, God decided that those who hoped in him, in his redemption and restoration of all things, would be given life with him and not be separated. But even though in God's mercy he takes away the punishment of sin and death, he never stops being just. And he didn't fail to hold David accountable for his ac actions. Notice the second part of David's self-imposed judgment, that the man would have to pay back four of what he stole. In the following chapters, we read as one after another of David's sons die. First is Bathsheba's son, the, wo the one that should have rightly been Uriah's. Next is Amnon, the one who violates his half-sister Tamar. Then it's Absalom, the one who murders Amnon and begins a civil war because of his father's lack of justice. And finally, after David is dead, the fourth and final son, Adonijah, is murdered by Solomon, non-coincidentally because of the words of Bathsheba. David was held accountable and the judgment he pronounced upon himself was the judgment he paid. I think one of the main reasons that I struggle with David is because I've heard one too many times people blame Bathsheba, make her the villain of the story. And I've also heard them use this particular story to avoid taking accountability for the wrong they've done especially as a leader and particularly as a spiritual leader. Well, David repented. I said I'm sorry to God and that's all I can do. But they forget that David was held accountable. His sin was very costly. And he watched as the consequences of his actions and his son's actions became their downfall. As for Bathsheba, 
What a fascinating story she has that we don't often look at. In the midst of those who have told me they've confessed their sins to God to avoid taking responsibility for their actions, I found a lot of comfort in her. She's the reason I wanted to do this sermon because her story asks the question, what do you do? How do you keep your hope in God when the very leader that God anointed, who ha is said was after God's own heart, that everyone praises and continues to praise long after they've heard your story, turns out to be the one to bring the greatest nightmares of your life upon you? How do you move forward with God when people hear their name and say, he's my favorite, but when people hear yours, despite the fact that you were the victim, it just makes everyone uncomfortable. If you've ever been a victim of abuse, if you've ever known the pain of losing so much and everyone praising the person who hurt you, I'm so sorry. God sees God cares, that never should have happened to you. And we have resources that we can connect you to, if that's you today. And if that's not your story, I'm so thankful. But I think regardless of whether or not you found yourself to be the victim of someone else's poor choices, we all have these moments that are like branches where the life we had thought we would have gets cut off suddenly. For Bathsheba, this is her moment. I wonder if she ever dreamed of the life she would have had with Uriah, of the children she would have had with him. I wonder what her lament sounded like after he died and after her child died because of David's actions. If there were words or just weeping, and if there was words, if someone had seen them as important enough to write down, if we would be singing them alongside David's lament today. The song we do get written down for David is found in Psalm 21, I mean 51. It's one of his more famous psalms because it gives us the language of how to turn to God when we've been the ones who have sinned, which we all have been. So we all need it. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. David knows that he can't save himself from the spiral. He can't repair what he's done. He can't bring Uriah back to life. He can't take back what he did to Bathsheba. But David hopes in a God who can bring the dead back to life where the lowly are exalted in the great reversal. He's seen it before in his life, and now he bows himself low before God once again and says, my request is this, that you recreate me. You take my heart and my spirit and renew it. My requ request is that you don't take your Holy Spirit from me, that you don't cast me away from your presence. And this, this is why we love David. Because when confronted with the horrors of what he did, his response is to confess his wrong and to worship, to run to God instead of running away. And this is so hard for us to do. It takes real faith that God can still use even the broken pieces of our lives for something beautiful. We all know that David lost four sons, but in 1 Chronicles 3.5, we read that Bathsheba gained four sons. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. One of the sons was given the same name as the man who spoke on her behalf when her voice was counted as nothing. And one became the king over all Israel. She got to see in her lifetime the great reversal of God, but what she couldn't see 
was that she would become the ancestor, the grandmother, the line through which God would bring the Messiah. The very worst moments of her life, God rewove to become the very thing through which God would redeem and renew the whole world. She became the agent of the new creation. So my message today is this, and it's very simple, and yet it takes faith. The message is, there is hope. There is hope for the worst moments of our lives, whether we were the villain or we were the victim, to become a part of the restoration of all things in both the greatest mistakes of our lives and the greatest wrongs that have been done to us, there is hope in the redemption of Christ when we run to him and place it in his hands. There is hope that God will somehow make everything beautiful in its time, that the years that the locusts have stolen will be restored, that our lament won't be lasting but there will be laughter again. David, in my opinion, was not a great man because one time he slayed a giant. We remember David not because he was great, but because he was greatly loved by a God who created him, saw him out in the wilderness, plucked him out of the pit, and then stayed with him even when he decided to go right back into the mire after receiving a kingdom. David is great because God transformed his greatest failures to be a part of the story of God rescuing the world from all brokenness. We love David because when confronted with his sin, he drew near to God and worshiped. In the midst of the worst failures, he hoped in God. Now, I'm going to invite the worship team back up, and in a moment, we're going to sing the words of David. And I want us all to ask ourselves a question. Where have we lost hope in God? That God sees, that God cares, that God will hold accountable, and that God will forgive? Where have we lost hope that even this, whatever it is, can be transformed and renewed when placed in God's hands? What do we need to confess to God and say, God, I've tried to get out of the spiral again and again, and it's never worked, so I've given up? Where do we need to hope in God's creative power to work again. Maybe it's for ourselves, and maybe it's for our friends and family or community. So we're gonna sing a couple of songs. One is familiar and one is new. And I want you to use this time to listen to God, to confess and to listen for God's response and remember that Jesus has removed our sin from us. There may be repairs we need to make, but the sin and death is paid for. So let's stand and sing together. <laughs> 